I'm thrilled to turn over to this year's Henry and Brian and David awardee, Sunshine Hillegas. Thank you, Sunshine. Thank you so much. It is such a terrific honor uh, to be able to, to give this lecture virtually. I am crossing my fingers that technology you know, holds up in Durham and DC and, and in your homes. And as Mary Ellen mentioned, I will try and keep my remarks to about 25 minutes. So we have plenty of time for questions. I'm gonna be talking about the issue of youth turnout in this election, but I suspect that some people could have more general questions about campaign elections, the crazy politics of today. And I, I welcome those questions um, as well. Um, in many ways, all signs point to unprecedented levels of youth turnout in the 2020 election. You guys have probably seen the headlines. You know, CNN says young voters are going to be the key to winning 2020. USA Today says, I think they will decide the race. The New York Times says these 7 million people can beat Trump, referencing those young people coming of age in this election cycle. And no doubt those headlines are referencing the recent surge in youth activism that we have seen with protests on issues of racial injustice and police brutality. Poll numbers are also backing up these headlines. So a poll in June 2020 of 18 to 29 year olds found that 83% believe that young people have the power to uh, change the country. Uh, a survey of college students in August found that 71% said they are absolutely certain to vote in this election. Unfortunately, my lecture today is going to throw a little cold water on some of that optimism. Um, you know, if uh, history is any guide, the enthusiasm, interest, and motivation that we see today in those protests and in those poll numbers won't translate at the ballot box. Just think back to the 2018 election. We saw similar headlines about a surge in youth turnout. And in fact, there was actually historic youth turnout in that election cycle, but it increased from about 21% turnout rate in 2014 to about 30% turnout rate in 2018. So the highest youth turnout in decades in a congressional election still had two thirds of young people staying at home. And that's not new, right? Looking back through history, we see pretty consistently that young people are not voting and are voting at much lower rates than older people. So um, if you look at the dark, thick line um, in the graphic, what you'll see is that's the difference in turnout rate between those who are 60 and those who are 18 to 29 years old. And there are ups and downs in presidential election years. Younger people are more likely to show up than in midterm election years, but the gap remains consistent. And by the way, this gap, although I don't really talk about it, is even larger in local elections where you can have a gap of about 50 percentage points between older and younger voters. So despite being one of the largest potential voting blocks in the electorate, young people are not voting. And, and just to give context, this gap between younger and older voters is larger than the gap that we see by race and ethnicity, by socioeconomic status, or by education. It's also larger in the United States than it is across the world. So in an analysis of the comparative study of electoral systems, we find that the US has a larger gap in turnout between young and old voters than any of the 34 other advanced democracies in the study. And it matters. Turnout disparities are not just about making sure that people are participating in democracy. They also sh shape the policies um, that are passed. They shape who gets elected and the policies that are implemented. There's a reason in this country that social security is a third rail and education spending is not. So why is it that young people are not voting? And is there anything that we can do about it? These are the questions that motivated my recent book, Making Young Voters, um, co-authored with John Holbein, an assistant professor at UVA. Um, the book came out in February, about uh, a week before the whole country shut down because of the pandemic and everybody promptly ignored it. So I am very appreciative of the opportunity um, to talk about the book. And I will reference some of the findings from the book, but I also want to focus on the way that the pandemic itself has further complicated youth turnout and what that might mean for participation um, this election cycle. One of the key take home messages of the book is that the problem of youth turnout, the cause of youth turnout is often misdiagnosed. The conventional wisdom is that young people are not voting because they are apathetic and disinterested in politics, that millennials are cynical and self-absorbed and more concerned about taking selfies than about influencing politics. But of course, the protests that you see in the streets and the poll numbers that I just referenced make clear that the conventional wisdom is wrong. The issue is not a lack of political interest or a lack of political motivation. So quite simply, young people have all of the civic attitudes and precursors to civic participation. 
And not just in 2020 or in 2018, if we look back in history, young people have long shown an interest in politics. So just in the last five presidential elections, for instance, an average of 85% of 18 to 29 year olds said they were interested in the election. 75% said they cared who got elected. And most importantly, more than 80% when asked before the election said they intended to vote. And yet they don't. So they are staying home despite high levels of political interest. So um, there is a large gap between the attitudes and intentions that young people have and their actual voting behavior. So political motivation is already high. So that can't be the solution to solving the low levels of youth turnout. I mean, yes, it would be great if rather than 80%, it was 100% of young people who said that they plan to, to vote but it's, it's not going to solve the problem. Political interest is a necessary but not sufficient condition for participation. The problem for young people is not that they're disinterested, rather they fail to follow through on their civic attitudes and intentions. The gap between the intention to vote and the actual behavior of young people is much larger than it is for older people as well. So the key to understanding and solving youth turnout is to identify why it is that young people so often fail to follow through on their participatory intentions. In the book, we throw the kitchen sink at trying to understand this phenomenon. We use a variety of methods and data, so longitudinal surveys and randomized control trials and survey experiments and voter files and qualitative interviews. Um, we show that the link between intentions and behaviors um, in the realm of voting is not unlike what we find in other behavioral intentions. So whether you're talking about the intention to exercise or to eat healthy or to study for an exam, that the individuals who are most likely to follow through on their intentions are those who have what are called non-cognitive skills. These are um, competencies related to self-regulation and interpersonal um, relationships. And uh, these soft skills or social emotional skills are something that help individuals persevere when they encounter distractions or obstacles. And they've been shown across a variety of other fields to matter for a number of other outcomes, we were the first to really link them to um, civic behavior. And if you're interested, I'm happy to answer questions or would point you to the book. Um, today, what I want to talk about are what exactly those obstacles are that are preventing young people from following through on their intentions and focusing um, specifically on how they could be exacerbated by the pandemic. So for experienced voters, it might be you know, hard to remember that voting is anything but easy. Um, if you've lived in the same place, you haven't had to re-register for many years, your polling location is probably the same, you likely have a voter ID, uh, a, a driver's license that serves as a voter ID if you need it. But for young people, registration and voting can be a burdensome and confusing process. Young people come of age at a time when their lives are highly transient and unstable, and when the process of registering and voting is often most complicated. So when we identify the obstacles that keep people from following through, some of those obstacles are personal. They're a reflection of stage in life, but many of them are institutional. They're the rules about who, when, and where people can vote, and they have a larger impact on new voters than on experienced voters. So let me outline some of the obstacles that impede youth turnout. First, election rules matter. Residency rules, registration deadlines, voter ID requirements, ballot access, they all vary widely across the country and in and of itself make it more difficult to navigate the process of registering to vote. Um, but critically, research shows that when registration and voting is easier, turnout is higher, particularly among young people. This particular graph offers one summary of some of those um, electoral laws, with the dark states being those that are easiest for people to participate and the lighter states being those that are harder. Really illustrates the source of variation. I I'm gonna to skip over kind of the empirical analysis that, that goes into showing that these laws matter and instead just offer you a few illustrations um, of uh, really the clarity about how um, these rules can matter. Consider the state of Texas. I suspect that many of you have heard about their restrictive mail-in voting rules um, and um, the you know, limitation to a single drop box per county to drop off those mail-in ballots. But if you're coming of age in Texas, there are significant barriers just to registration. So several states have what are called pre-registration laws where young people as young as 16 are able to fill out their registration form. And when they turn 
18, they're able to vote. They have, they have gotten over that barrier. That's not available in Texas. And in fact, in Texas, you have to wait until you're 17 years and 10 months before you're able to submit a registration form. That form must be submitted 30 days before an election. And you can't submit your registration form online. And many of the places that you would fill out your registration form in person, schools, government offices have been closed because of the pandemic. And voter registration the, the drives themselves are quite difficult in Texas because in order to register someone else to vote, you have to be certified as a volunteer deputy um, by the county in which you're registering people to vote. And that certification um, expires every election year. So if you actually get around to registering to vote, you should also recognize that Texas is a state with strict voter ID laws. And a student ID does not count in order to vote, although your handgun license will. So there are a variety of states um, beyond Texas that similarly have this 30-day registration deadline um, and also have restrictions on how old you need to be um, in order to fill out your registration form. Georgia and Alaska, for instance, are a couple of those. Georgia is also a state that has a strict voter ID. In Georgia, however, student IDs do work um, in order to vote, but only if you go to a public college and not a private one. In Wisconsin, student IDs can be used if they fulfill a set of pretty strict requirements requirements, where um, last I heard only three of the universities in the state um, meet the standard. And even then, if you use a student ID in Wisconsin, you still have to show that you are in fact um, a registered student by demonstrating, for instance, a, a zero balance tuition bill. In New Hampshire, they recently passed a law where they deliberately, they acknowledged that it was to discourage out of state students from voting, in which if you register to vote in New Hampshire, it starts a clock and within 60 days, you must have your uh, New Hampshire's driver's license. All of these are registration laws that are making it more difficult for young people to just register to vote, the first step in voting. COVID has, of course, made all of this more complicated. So 20 million college students in the US, it's estimated that some 14 million of them had their college plans disrupted by the pandemic, sometimes suddenly. Um, and this has displaced students and created a lot of confusion about residency rules. So if you're a college student that is registered in your college town, but you're currently living with your parents, where are you supposed to vote? If you're a college student that lived on campus, but the campus was suddenly shut down, do you need to re-register? If you're a college student who is living on campus right now, but know that as soon as the semester is over, you have to leave, does it qualify as um, residency? States have these very obtuse residency rules that often talk about um, what your plans are in the future. And it can be confusing about um, what you need to do in order to follow the rules. And different organizations are oftentimes giving different advice to students um, depending on different circumstances. What election lawyers will tell you just to clear it up is the short answer is that college students can typically define for themselves um, their residency. So beyond um, the, the first step of getting registered, um, there are concerns about the safety of in-person voting, the potential for long lines um, because of poll worker shortages. Um, and there is increased interest in mail-in voting, but there is also evidence of widespread misperceptions about access, about procedures, and about security. Um, a July poll found that um, more than half of those under the age of 35 felt they didn't have enough information to be able to vote by mail. Here again, many states have burdensome requirements that disproportionately affect young people. Some states, they have accommodations if you're over the age of 65, um, including in states that are not allowing fear of COVID to qualify to request a mail-in ballot, those same states are automatically mailing those over the age of 65 an absentee ballot. In Alabama, your, ba your ballot must be notarized unless you're over the age of 65. In Mississippi, your application to request a ballot must be notarized. In Missouri, your ballot needs to be notarized, and if you have a mail-in ballot but not an absentee ballot, your notary can charge you to, to get that notarized. In Oklahoma, you typically um, have to get your absentee ballot notarized, and the law prohibits notaries from signing more than 20 absentee ballots in any one election. Okay, so hopefully you're starting to get a sense of some of the complications um, for young people registering and voting. And we haven't even talked about differences across states and postage laws, right? Some states pay for the postage um, for your mail-in ballot and, and others don't. Um, there have been dozens of lawsuits that have popped up. Um, some of them, you know, fighting to make voting easier in the pandemic, um, others fighting those efforts to make voting easier. Whatever the effects of any given rule and the outcome, certainly one consequence is that there is increased uncertainty and confusion. We know this all too well in North Carolina. So in North Carolina, um, we had passed a, a law for pre-registration in 2009. 
Um, it was repealed in 2013. The courts overturned that in 2016. I had a youth advocacy group tell me that in 2016, they decided to sit out North Carolina because they were just too uncertain about what the rules would be. Same thing with voter ID. We've had voter ID passed and overturned and then passed by constitutional amendment and then currently stayed. Um, but research has shown that voter ID has depressed turnout in North Carolina, even in those elections in which it wasn't um, actually in place because people thought that it was. So where does this leave us? Almost certainly, youth turnout is not going to live up to those polling numbers or headlines. Already, we see that new registrations in 2020 compared to 2016 are lagging, especially for 18 to 19 year olds. This particular analysis from Circle compares registration rates of 18 to 19 year olds in 2020, August 2020 um, relative to November 2016. That still gives a little time for states to catch up, but most states are talking about how with the pandemic that new registrations have been trickling in. Beyond lower registration rates because of the pandemic, we can expect that young voters will be more likely than older voters to be forced to submit a provisional ballot. Uh, one study of states with new voting restrictions found that 24% of millennials um, had to submit a provisional ballot compared to just 6% of boomers. Provisional ballots are far more likely to ultimately not be counted. Uh, we can also expect that younger voters, more than older voters, will have their mail-in ballots rejected. In one study by the California Voter Foundation found that re the rejection rate for mail-in ballots of 18 to 24 year olds was three times higher than the overall rejection rates. Okay, so that's some depressing news, <laughs> um, you know, predictions about 2020. Um, I would like to talk about the solutions. So, you know, how is it that we increase youth turnout? Um, let me start by reiterating what we don't need to do. We're not gonna increase youth turnout by increasing interest in the election or making voting cool. Young people are already interested. They already care. They already think that a lot is at stake in the election. What we need to do is make registration and voting easier. So we need these reforms to happen at the federal level, not just relying on the goodwill of state legislatures, to, who too often assume that there's some strategic advantage to be had from various electoral rules, reforms, or restrictions. One of the most frustrating aspects of this project has been to see the way in which youth turnout has been politicized. Making it easier for young people to vote will not inevitably and always benefit Democrats or hurt Republicans. Political science research has made clear that assumptions about partisan advantage associated with electoral reforms are often wrong. For example, mail-in voting, absentee ballots do not benefit historically one side or the other. Motor voter, people predicted that it was going to be this great boon for Democrats. It was promptly followed by the Republican takeover of the House and more Republican than Democratic presidential administrations. Our own research in Florida, we found that the adoption of pre-registration actually helped to shrink the Democratic advantage among young people because young Republicans who pre-registered were actually slightly more likely to vote than young Democrats who pre-registered. In North Carolina, those who are unaffiliated were more likely to use pre-registration and the numbers of unaffiliated swamped either Democrats or Republicans. So the reforms that are most effective at expanding the electorate um, are also the ones that make it most difficult to predict how people will behave once they enter the electorate. So it's very short-sighted to assume that just because you think young people today might have some democratic advantage, that that's going to be the case in the future. Young people are both more likely to split their ticket down the ballot, they're more likely to, to change their vote from one election to the next. And in fact, there's evidence that they're actually more responsive to the performance of government because they don't have the longstanding party loyalties of other voters. So the other thing we need to do is rethink the way that we teach civics. So in the book, we have this exhaustive empirical uh, analysis that shows that, that current civic education is is having precisely zero effect on turnout. It's not just that we are teaching less civics than we were in the past, I mean, that is true, but we're teaching the wrong civics. Um, we're teaching what we call bubble sheet civics, where we're focusing on memorization about history and government, rather than talking about politics today or the actual information that people need in order to register to vote. So we need schools to talk about current politics. In our qualitative interviews with teachers, we often found reluctance to um, you know, engage in, about politics today because of fear of what parents 
um, say. So we need better training of teachers for them to navigate um, uh, political issues in the classroom. We need to teach the mechanics of registration and voting. It's not just that people need to memorize the you know, chief justice of the Supreme Court. They need to know what do they do if they get to the polling location and they're not on the voter roll. We need the actual mechanics of how they vote. We need schools to be involved in voter registration. That doesn't mean putting a table up in the cafeteria. That means offering actual in-class instruction and assistance in completing registration forms. Finally, civic education needs to help clear up misperceptions about the voting process and informational requirements of, of being a good voter. One of the themes that came across in our qualitative interviews is that young people often didn't feel well-informed enough to vote despite their intentions and interests. They would tell me that they planned to do more research on the campaigns and the issues, and it didn't happen, so they ultimately didn't want to just vote for party, and so they didn't feel qualified um, to, to make a vote. They seem to hold themselves to a higher informational standard than older voters. Um, experienced voters know it's not necessary to know every single candidate of every race um, down the entire ballot, or, or every issue that's being talked about. Uh, younger voters, on the other hand, a survey found that 48% said that not knowing enough about the issues is a reason to not get involved. When asked the question, um, do you feel that all eligible American citizens should vote or should people only vote if they're well informed about the elections? Only 40% of 18 to 29 year olds said that all people should vote compared to 64% of those 65 plus. We need to do a better job of explaining to young people that the two party system means that we are able to muddle through. People are able to vote rationally. They don't have to know every single issue, the stance of every single candidate and everything from city council to the dog catcher race, right? They can muddle through by figuring out does a D or an R better represent their interests in this election cycle? Um, and that's currently something that I think that both the way we teach civics education, but also kind of the hyper information environment in which you could spend every minute of every day researching more about politics, um, creates this expectation that people have to have a lot of political knowledge. Um, finally, you know, most of what needs to be done in terms of increasing youth turnout, you know, can't happen in this election cycle, right? It, it's, it's about changing laws and improving education. But there are lessons, I think, from our research about what youth advocacy groups and mobilization campaigns might do. So rather than trying to uh, focus on um, making the campaign interesting or talking about uh, the candidates, the, the, the advocacy groups and the campaigns need to focus on follow through. So perhaps rather than celebrity endorsements, they need to send calendar reminders. Maybe they need to give out pizza and water when there's a long line at the polling place. They should provide postage stamp to college students that need to, to put them on their absentee ballots. And so what I would urge is for all of you who know young people, you probably know young people who are politically interested and engaged, and I want you to make sure that they are able to overcome the barriers that they might fa face when actually trying to cast a ballot. So I will stop there and turn it over to Mary Ellen for questions. <laughs>